we see that politicians are mainly promising that taxes are going to go down and that they will find additional sources of funding for something, you know, for certain, let's say, groups among the electorates and so on. So if you <laughs> always promise to decrease taxes and to increase spending, well, obviously, the debt is going to be on the rise. And we see that it's, um, uh, let's say, quite substantial, even in the European Union and United States, uh, debt to GDP is very high. But in countries that do have more foreign investors and that do not have capacity to issue their own money like greece or like italy or like france for that matter that may turn out to be uh, let's say something that can destabilize their uh, credit rating in the domain of international investors and that may produce some sort of uh, let's say fiscal problems that uh, cannot be easily solved if we just stick to this very rigid way of looking at things and there is um, no monetizing of of public debt uh, uh, whatever whatever the cost hello everybody this is pascal from neutrality studies and it is my great pleasure to introduce to you today once more an economist and a real monetary practitioner of the very highest order I've got with me Dejan Šoškic, the former governor of the National Bank of Serbia, which is, of course, Serbia's central bank, meaning the institution that prints the Serbian currency. He served in this function from 2010 until 2012. Dr. Šoškic is also currently a professor at the Faculty of Economics at the University of Belgrade and an advisor to several private and central banks. Professor Šoškic, thank you so much for coming online today. Thank you for inviting me. Um, I wanted to talk to a real central banker for a very long time because central banking is one of the most fascinating parts of the the monetary system and the the, the intersection of of money and politics. Um, and my first question is like I always think of central bankers as people who probably use very realistic approaches to trying to estimate the economy and how, how different uh, different parts of the economy work together. And to me, the theory that describes this the best, the money mechanics, is modern monetary theory, MMT. You, as a formal central banker, do you follow MMT thinking or not? Well, you know, I've been uh, obviously uh, introduced to the subject when it uh, came about in international domain. Uh, modern monetary theory sounds uh, innovative and modern and so on. But basically, if I look at the um, certain elements within this theory, uh, there is really uh, not too much uh, new in my view. You know, uh, if you say that the government can print its own money, uh, we know that, right? Uh, that it can um, uh, always finance uh, the government debt without a problem if the government debt is um, uh, in local currency. Uh, we know that. I mean, you're sitting in Japan, and Japan is basically a very good example that the country can even drive the public debt to GDP above 250%, and you will not have um, a public debt crisis, because it's not uh, the same um, whether you're issuing debt in your own currency, which you can print, or you're issuing debt in, in another country's currency, which is the case basically with most of the countries in the Eurozone today. And uh, for the emerging economies also, which are, uh, you know, uh, forced more or less in order to sell their their government debt, they, they need to denominate this debt in dollars, mainly to a certain extent in euros, right? So uh, the governments which have this capacity to issue their own currency and to have their debt in their own currency will never go broke. And I would say that's uh, more... Uh, um, uh, than, than easy to follow and to understand. Now, what the, the new uh, monetary theory, the modern monetary theory, uh, basically is trying to revoke is something that has been used previously in, I would say, in the history of um, monetary uh, policies throughout the world. We have seen in many instances situation in which the governments would produce money more than is basically uh, equivalent 
or let's say um, appropriate to uh, preserve price stability. And we have, for instance, where the people tend to, uh, uh, you know, um, nowadays especially think about the war uh, that Israel was waging in 1967 against the Arab neighbors and so on. But people uh, do not uh, um, also uh, have in mind that at that time Israel was running high inflation, more than 400% a year because it was financing these huge expenditures right uh, not to mention the weimar um, uh, republic and the inflation of 1922 1923 you know we have been reading about that from remark books and so on um, after the second world war in many countries including the country of yugoslavia in which i was born we had this cycle of relatively high inflation because the government was basically printing more money and was paying for the expenditures which they obviously did not tax before, because they simply were relying on the fact that they can produce money, they were paying for these expenditures, and however much taxes they, they uh, collect, well, that's good enough, but there is a surplus that needs to be paid and was paid by the production of money. However, the problem here is with the measure, how much you do this. Because this way of producing money is the one that is very frequently not considered by most of the analysts today. This is a non-debt production of money. Okay, When you do the, the so-called um, monetization of public debt, that means that you basically produce money to finance your um, uh, government debt expend ex expenditures. And if that is uh, uh, too high for the current circumstances of the economy, that may generate inflation. You know, whoever thinks that inflation uh, in the United States and in the world in 1922 and 1923 doesn't have anything to do with prior huge monetary and fiscal expansion of the U.S. in uh, 2020 and 2021, the last, um, uh, the last plan delivered by, by the Trump administration and the first package of the Biden administration, they were huge. You know, they were running government deficits in 2020, uh, roughly 15% of uh, US GDP was was a fiscal deficit in, in the US at that time. And then uh, roughly about 12% in next year. And then you had inflation after that, not just in the US, but also globally, because uh, dollar is being used for most of the international transactions as and also as as um, you know the the um, way in which uh, uh, international commodities are being traded on international markets all of them are more or less expressed in us dollars so once the dollar starts losing value in its own market it also starts losing value wherever it's being used as as a, a means of payments but it very much depends on the capacity or the need for that currency of the economy and with the US dollar, of course, not just the domestic one, but 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 uh, abroad as well, because Japan, again, is this example of a of a highly, highly um, uh, expansionary fiscal policy. Right. They they between 2010 or the 2012 and 2022, the Japan, uh, the Japanese National Bank kind of tripled or, or quad, quadrupled the fiscal base which is like huge, but they didn't manage to hit their 2% inflation target, <laughs> which they had, which is just a, a sign that the markets wanted to suck this up, right? The bonds, like the markets love Japanese yen denominated government bonds. They take them like like candy. Yeah, yeah. Um, yes, they're considered to be obviously a risk-free asset, which is in demand by the pension funds and other institutional investors, but also private investors. Why not to have a safe asset? It's much better to have a government bond than the deposit in a bank. Government is much more secure than the deposit in a bank. So every bank is basically higher risk than the government. So it's natural to have high demand for these. On the other hand, you know, um, a lot of these uh, bonds are being bought internally. So the Japanese investors are staying in line to buy Japanese bonds, and therefore uh, the fragility of the system is much less than is the case with the, some of the emerging markets, or was the case with Greece, for instance, where foreigners kept a lot of a lot of uh, debt and were willing to withdraw when they perceive uh, the risk uh, being on the rise. Plus, Greece Greece didn't have the ability to monetize uh, its way uh, to to print its its money its way out of this of this uh, of uh, uh, situation, which is was it was basically indebted in a foreign currency, one they didn't have control over. Would you agree to that? 
Yes, absolutely. Uh, Euro is a foreign currency, Fabrice. Okay, it cannot produce euros as they want. They, uh, the German, uh, Germany also cannot. France cannot. You know, so the decision of um, production of of euro lays within the ECB, and we have seen at that time uh, basically uh, quite a frictional environment in ECB and among the other uh, European Union institutions, because um, a normal thing would be to try to help these economies which are failing in a sense to be more open to buy their their debt and to support the value of their bonds in the marketplace, basically to start printing money, producing money for the for the purposes of providing financial stability however uh, that was very much opposed by a group of of countries within the eurozone and we have seen that the idea w that prevailed at the end was the one which was driving towards austerity and was basically treating uh, the functioning of the um, uh, you know uh, budget of the country like the budget of a household which is not the case you know, it, someone would also, I would say, make a very good point saying, well, what would happen if there was a complete monetization of Greek sovereign debt uh, uh, when the problem occurred? What would happen? How much uh, percentage of the total uh, volume of money within the EU would be, would be spent? Would we have the crisis? Would we have the, the uh, let's say, low levels of recovery post-crisis of 2007 and 8, which actually happened in the Eurozone? So what is the cost and benefits of sticking to this very rigid formula that you do not need to, that you cannot um, uh, uh, use uh, monetizing of, of, of uh, public debt in certain situations? What I want to say is that in, let's say, last 20 or 30 years, it has become this, uh, no monetizing of public debt has become, um, let's say, the prevailing dogma in the global uh, financial circles. That is a no-no thing to do, actually. You cannot uh, print money and buy a government bond directly, but you can do the same thing, uh, print money and buy the government bond on so-called secondary markets. Now, what is the difference between these two paths? The first path is monetizing the public debt, right? Creating more money. The second path actually says something like this. The government, if they want to borrow, they need to borrow on, uh, you know, private markets, sell the bonds to the, to the uh, banks and the others, and then uh, you will not be expanding money. But then, in a, so, yeah, so to say, a separate uh, step, the central bank would, in line with their open market policies, start buying that debt and basically issuing more money. So instead of doing it in one step, you do it in two steps. The outcome is quite similar. You know? you're, just, you're cutting in the, the, the private sector and giving them a little, a, a little more uh, um, profit than they otherwise would have, right? Because you, you buy it at a little premium from them. Yes, I mean, uh, the bond is actually, uh, as you have said, in, uh, um, you know, in, in case of Japan, but also in case of many other countries, government bond is a very, very uh, desired asset to have, you know. Uh, it is, uh, you know, some people say that uh, rich individuals and rich institutions, uh, instead of being taxed, uh, have been given an opportunity to basically invest in bonds and to receive interest, right? Mm. So uh, that's in line with, with those um, uh, people that are advocating for the, let's say, increase in taxation as a way to solve to solve uh, many of the problems related to the public uh, financial sector in, in, in the world globally. Because if we analyze what is going on in a normal political cycle in decades uh, before us, right? We see that politicians are mainly promising that taxes are going to go down and that they will find additional sources of funding for something, you know, for certain, let's say, groups among the electorates and so on. So if you <laughs> always promise to decrease taxes and to increase spending, well, obviously, the debt is going to be on the rise. And we see that it's, um, uh, let's say, quite substantial, even in the European Union and United States, uh, debt to GDP is very high. In, in Japan, it's also, uh, let's say, um, uh, uh, above all of these limits, but still Japan is stable. But in countries that do have 
more foreign investors and that do not have capacity to issue their own money, like Greece or like Italy or like France for that matter, that may turn out to be, uh, let's say, something that can destabilize their uh, credit rating in the domain of international investors and that may produce some sort of, uh, let's say, fiscal problems that uh, cannot be easily solved if we just stick to this very rigid way of looking at things and there is um, no monetizing of of public debt uh, uh, whatever whatever the cost there is this conception that if the if we monetize uh, 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 the economy i mean if public debt rises because we, we we monetize the expenditures then what we are doing is to offload uh today's consumption on future generations. Future generations will have to pay back the public debt. Future generations will suffer because they have to physically come up with the cash to to pay for our for our consumption today. And I think that's a completely misguided way of thinking of how this works. But how do you think about it? Well, I, I think of it in the following way. First of all, if you monetize the public debt, it doesn't mean that the debt is going to be on the rise. You know, you simply um, you know, produce money and not create additional uh, additional indebtedness of the country. That's that's one aspect. The second aspect is that um, uh, it's not. We need to go into details. What is the government really financing? Is it uh, uh, having expenditures which are, um, so to say, targeting increasing the overall volume of our pie? of our cake, which we call GDP. Um, that is very si similar like in, uh, in normal household consumption. If we take a loan just to buy, let's say, uh, whatever, a car or a TV set, well, tomorrow we will have same income from which we need to uh, take a certain portion and repay back. So our demand is going to fall in the future because I, our demand has increased today, okay? But if the government invests or if the household invests, if you invest, for instance, in your human capital, you, you pay tuition and get, uh, let's say, better education. So tomorrow, because of this investment, you may have a higher salary. <clears throat> then it does not necessarily mean that uh, raising uh, the debt level today is going to be higher burden for the future generations, because maybe future generations will have higher, basically, uh, uh, income and therefore will not be uh, so much burdened with, with repaying, repaying back of the debt. However, in terms of uh, these, uh, 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 let's say, circumstances in which, we're, which we were in the last 10 or so years with hugely um, decreased level of interest rates, then uh, one could have advocated also that really doesn't matter if the interest rates are close to zero or sometimes even negative, you know, the, the amount of debt uh, really doesn't matter that much, you know. I keep saying, I mean, the 250 or 300% debt to GDP in Japan, it doesn't matter. It could be 3,000 as long as the demand is there for the for 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 that kind of money to circulate. It's all fine. It's it won't collapse because it's a, it's a it's a circular system anyhow. If the investor base is uh, ready to invest, uh, as you say, uh, whenever the bonds are available, uh, so if there is uh, a demand, if no one wants to uh, pull out, if there is um, if there is the debt in the currency which can be produced by the country which is issuing debt, that's a very important aspect. If there is a country which has potentially um, room to increase other taxes, like Japan, I understand, has a relatively low uh, value-added tax, Yeah. right? So if there is in, in such an economy, if you would just, you know, tackle that issue, maybe rise a little bit more uh, <clears throat> on the side of the value added tax, you would be generating huge income for the government. But the, the debt itself is something that uh, is not bad on its own. It is something that uh, basically uh, shouldn't be, in my view, shouldn't be uh, uh, rising without any control. And that can also uh, sometimes um, the government expenditures can also generate uh, 
inflation. You know, we we need to worry about what happens to inflation. It's not just uh, whether we are going to increase the debt, but we sometimes need to take out the demand from the system by issuing bonds in order not to generate inflation in the economy. So the in these, but it's also, uh, let's say, uh, from country to country, you know, uh, um, emerging countries are, I would say, the most vulnerable ones. Um, that is something that that uh, sometimes is, is being overlooked, you know, and we when we tend to think in uh, terms of how um, United States has been fighting inflation in 1980s. And there was this very successful central bank governor, Paul Walker, you know, and uh, he was uh, successful in curbing down inflation in the United States. But at the same time, in order to accomplish that, he has risen interest rates so high that all of the other countries which were forced to issue their public debt in dollars needed to basically uh, uh, race uh, with with these interest rates. So uh, that's why Mexico, um, Argentina, Brazil and the others simply couldn't uh, pay these high interest rates. And that, then we had this uh, sovereign debt crisis uh, on the level of, of emerging and developing economies at the time. Yeah, yeah but again, of states that, do, that issued uh, debt denominate it not in their own currency that's just the original yes. thing right and sometimes you have to but it's then what you lose control over um i need to switch a little bit because you um you as the governor of the national bank of serbia ex officio by your own out of having that position you also became at the in 2010 then a member of the board of the bank of international settlement right well, I, that's not a member of the board, but my country is um, a member country of BIS, mm -hmm. and I have been uh, as as such invited on these meetings, which are every two months, uh, yeah. to participate in certain discussions. But the BIS is is um, let's say um, a very useful ground for discussions, but at the same time, the most important countries are basically um, much more involved in, in creation of, of uh, potential regulation uh, for, for the financial system as a whole in the world. I was just wondering about the BIS, the Bank for International Settlement, because that one is such an interesting institution for the way that it is, that it exists, basically extraterritorial and having its sovereignty over itself as a as a bank and functioning as the bank for central banks. And there's a lot of myths around it, about, about uh, its shadowy operations. But I think a lot of that is is misguided. I mean, the BIS... What exactly does the BIS do? And when you met in these meetings, what was what was the main thing that you were uh, concerned with? A lot of things that are being discussed were basically uh, um, uh, <clears throat> regarding the regulation of the banking system and other financial institutions. And that is a, a very good forum uh, where the central bankers can get together and they... Um, basically produce papers which are publicly available. You, When you go to the website of BIS, you will see that there are some uh, um, work in progress documents which are publicly available, available to anyone to read, analyze, and uh, give their own critique. And by doing so, basically help the process of, of uh, developing these documents until they reach their final stage. And once they are adopted, they then need to be basically implemented in the local national legislations in order to um, you know, properly work. And I would say that that, that is a very good system of providing a level playing field for institutions like banks are that are operating in various countries, you know, not to have some sort of, you know, um, uh, uh, comparative advantages because you're operating in a jurisdiction which has lower level of, of criteria uh, demanded from from um, you as a bank and so on so uh, which is which is called uh, you know uh, very frequently like like um, uh, uh, moving from one jurisdiction to another in order to avoid avoid uh, you know complicated environment um, BIS also was, was uh, I would say, the first real international financial organization uh, organized after uh, the First World War. It uh, was basically um, uh, expected to facilitate the uh, payments which were, um, um, you know, drawn as obligations from the Versailles Treaty mm -hmm. on certain countries, mainly Germany, right? 
But later on, it, and it's also basically the, the institution in which central banks can have their own accounts. So you can have, uh, you know, um, balance of payment settlements on their accounts. But nowadays, when you have the, the capacity to uh, freely trade and do payments on the level of commercial banks, that role is not that important anymore because you will have, for instance, increase and decrease in FX reserves of, of central banks um, uh, regardless of uh, whether you have uh, done anything through the um, uh, clearing a settlement system of the BIS. BIS, however, is still uh, offering certain instruments for the central banks which want to keep their reserves within the BIS. So to have them, let's say, um, uh, invested in a safe, liquid assets, which is basically the prerogative for all of FX reserves to be invested in, you know. Would that safe liquid asset be the for in, in ter, for the BIS now this this currency basket that they are that they're running, or is the currency basket really just an estimate of a unit of account? They have several several instruments which are basically, as you say, uh, as as a, uh, formed as baskets with various instruments inside, quite solid and 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 liquid and um, you know with low risks. So I would say that they are designed uh, very well for the um, you know purposes of central bank uh, needs in terms of managing their FX reserves. But do central banks these days? Um... Is a, national banks clear each each other's accounts through the central bank, and central banks among each other also have settlements to do. Do they do it mainly through the BIS, or do they do it mainly by holding accounts for each other and doing through direct um, uh, clearing for each other? Well, <clears throat> traditionally, the system was working in a way that the central banks would have gold as a main component of their reserves in the gold standard and so on. And then London was the place in which uh, many of the central banks would have their gold reserves being deposited in a standardized form. So whenever there would be a need to to pay from one central bank to another central bank, that would basically be done in a very simple way uh, in London, in the vaults of Bank of England. A certain amount of gold would be shifted from uh, you know deposit of one country to deposit of another country. Basically, then, physical uh, shifting. <laughs> Yes, yes. I mean, you you have the, the let's say the, you have still certain elements of uh, this today. You know, it's not just history, but it's not really practically uh, important today. You know, because today, uh, for instance, if one country is paying too much for the imports, right? By doing so, the commercial banks would be paying whatever they need to pay, right? Their clients would either have their own money or take the loan from someone, either locally or internationally. If there is not enough, um, uh, you know, uh, uh, foreign currency available, then the, there would be the pressure to depreciate the, the local currency from which the payments are, are, are being made, or there would be basically intervention from the reserves of the central bank. So that's the way how uh, this, uh, you know, um, balance of payments would be uh, finally, finally, uh, you know, equalized. So nowadays, this is not I would say, uh, you know, a priority in a normal functioning, but it's still available and some central banks still use it. And I would say that that uh, the BISC has done a, a great job in basically shifting away from their basic uh, um, uh, jobs for which it, it was designed for into a very important global forum for uh, discussion of financial topics we do know about the you know um, uh, basal standards basically and i think that because of the basal uh, biz bank the basal standards i i would say one of the most successful international standards being implemented globally because there is a, a forum in which debates go on and there is always a process of checking whether um, uh, the the uh, you know the regulation has been implemented in the national legislation, and uh, who is late on the promises, who is not late on the promises, and you know um, basically whatever is being um, you know produced as a document in BAS, that is something that is uh, on regular basis being implemented in various 
uh, national uh, uh, jurisdictions throughout the world, which is a very good thing for achieving, uh, you know, a level playing field for the global market. If you wouldn't have that, you would have always, always this, these situations which would uh, produce some sort of a competitive advantage for certain uh, um, players. And that would really be, in my view, uh, detrimental for the for the global financial system. And correct me if I'm wrong, but my impression is that central bankers in general are mostly interested and concerned with stability in the banking sector, not not necessarily the financial markets, but banking. That's something you want to be to be working stably, right? Well, it depends on what is the uh, what is the legal. Uh how to say, mandate that the central bank has uh, got uh, in, in a certain country. Mainly central banks are um, concerned with price stability, you know, to have a, a stable, uh, low level and stable inflation. And then uh, some of the central banks, which is now also the case with the European Central Bank, are also supervisors of the banking sector. And some of the central banks are also supervising other uh, financial um, uh, parts of financial markets and other types of financial institutions. Uh, since the crisis of 2007-8, central banks have um, you know, predominantly also adopted the function of, you know, um, financial stability, overall financial stability. And what, uh, as a rule, happens is that you would have on national levels some sort of a coordinating body between the central bank, the Ministry of Finance, and maybe there is other agency which is res responsible for supervision of certain financial institutions, that they would need to have some sort of a financial stability board or something on a national level. So financial stability is nowadays also a very important role for the central banks as well.